Um, okay, so let me get started and then if anybody has a question, just jump in, okay? Let me hide this thing while I <clears throat> Okay, it's not letting me. Okay, so the main thing is you need to review the homelessness hypo uh, that is on the website. Um, let me just start off with, did anybody have trouble seeing this or does everybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, you had trouble or yeah, you know what I'm talking about? I know what you're talking about. Okay, good. All right. Uh, if you don't, you can just email me and I can just send you the direct link. Um, but let me just start with kind of what your grading will be based on just this hypo alone. Um, you have to make sure that when you're explaining your answers, especially when it comes to injustice or how law can be used as a tool for resistance, uh, that you use the course materials. So some of you have struggled with that throughout the course. So in this uh, answer, you wanna make sure that you're actually referring to course materials specifically. So if you jump from like what a C minus would look like all the way to what an A would look like, is that it shows me that you're using the materials in a way that, that you're thinking and that your concepts are changing over time. Uh, the big kind of picture that you need to be thinking about is the, is the tension between legal resistance and then social con and control. And to understand that both of those things are legal or constitutional, um, which is, I think, the, the main struggle that many of you have had. So I just want you to kind of look at the B to C range and then the A minus to B plus range. Is there anything in there that you're not quite understanding or is that pretty straightforward? Okay, I'm going to guess from the silence that it's straightforward. Okay, so just thinking about the big picture, the, the main things you wanna think about are the PDF outline and then the video outline where I really explain in detail uh, what the point of this class is. Um, and then you really wanna go back to the, those videos on constitutions because they follow revolutions. So a lot of folks kind of seem to have that backwards um, in some of the answers where one student in particular, you know, said that in order for there to be a revolution or if there was some kind of social resistance that that somehow uh, would be like a social takeover. Um, that is what a constitution is, is a social takeover, right? It's a set of rules that society is agreeing to uh, follow. Uh, but if those are getting violated, then obviously society or different social groups would push back. So that's that whole concept of legal resistance. So again, just going to the big picture, you wanna see these things as kind of in pull with each other, right? On the one hand, some people wanna control society. They have a legal justification to do that. But on the other hand, any abuse of power, the other social groups have the right and legal uh, ability to resist that social control. And so you kinda of wanna see this. That's what those scales of justice, if you ever see that picture, um, that's really what this is representing. So I'm gonna move forward unless anybody has a question. Okay, so I believe everyone can get an A, uh, and on this particular exam, you have time. And so what you wanna do is just make sure that you've showed me that you've deepened your understanding, that you're not coming in with the same kind of ideas uh, that you came in the first day with. So the most consistent answer that students have given me over the last 10 years is that law is social control, or law is a command. It is certainly that thing, but it's not only that thing, right? There's other dimensions of law that you need to take into consideration. Um, if you haven't taken the practice final exam, you might do that just to get you to practice it. Uh, you will probably get better at your answers the more you actually do them. Uh, and then just show me that you've thought deeply and carefully about the information I gave you on your research paper and that you should apply some of that in explaining how your concepts have changed. Are there any questions on that? No. Okay. Anybody? It sounds like one more person. All right. So now I just want to review the course materials just in case, right, you didn't understand something. So again, just reminding you, 
right? These are like the main things that you need to be thinking about. You came in with ideas that weren't based in research. They weren't based in the course materials, right? So now you want to, how did those new course materials change your thinking? Um, the main thing is you want to think about any time that there's exclusion or injustice, then one group is going to be benefiting at the expense of another group. So that is unconstitutional. But the group that's being harmed has to bring some kind of legal resistance. They have to show that, that they're being harmed. Uh, otherwise, the other group will continue to benefit and there won't be any change. So what I tried to do in the very beginning was give you revolutions in which there were that change, right? So you saw groups realizing that they were being abused, that there was injustice, and so they took action, right? They, they had an idea and then they organized and then the people all kind of followed through with that idea. That's what kind of leads to social change. But then I want you to think about these big problems that we're kind of in now. So the first one was homelessness, uh, and you'll see like, I especially given the last few days, right, the uh, homeless people being targeted on the subway system. Um, you know, that's a group of people who've really been excluded uh, and are suffering from injustice from the present social order. But if you continue to look down, you've got migration, right? So immigrants are excluded. Uh, segregation, people are excluded from the education system, flood zone, people are ex uh, excluded from you know, better housing. Um, but on the other hand, right, you see something like black historical sites, that's a group of people who are now exercising as a social group their rights, right, and showing that they have the legal capacity to save their sites. It's a property-based approach. Um, and then that leads into this idea of the Atlantic slave trade, of understanding how race-based capitalism kind of got started and why it's still here today. I'm wondering if everybody kind of understands that idea. Yes, I understand. What about Samuel and Ashley? You're awfully quiet. No, yeah, I get it, I get it. Okay. Yeah, I understand. Okay, so that's, you know, a descriptive kind of answer. Um, so the rest of like your college career, uh, you're going to be measuring the gaps, right? You're going to be explaining how things happen, not just why, right? So the why we got into the easiest part is just kind of understanding um, racial capitalism and how exclusion happens. But why that occurs is a very complicated you know, subject, and, and there's no real good answer on that. Um, so how is easier to measure, and that's something that's pretty consistent in criminal justice and political science classes. So it's easy, the easiest way, no matter what the class is, uh, don't start with the ideal, right? The ideal is usually not real, right? It doesn't really ever exist. So start with the lived experience of those who have been excluded. You don't have to pick one group, right? You could compare two or three groups. Um, but if you start with people who have gone through injustice, the easiest question to ask then is who benefited from that injustice? Um, so it gets a little bit complicated, you know, if you think about it deeply. Uh, but if you think about, just for example, um, segregation in housing, uh, if black folks are targeted and then not allowed to purchase properties in certain neighborhoods, uh, you can see that white folks who are moving into those neighborhoods are benefiting from that exclusion. They're going to have lower property prices, they're going to have better interest rates, they're going to get better loans. And so that's kind of how we want to measure things, is who's benefiting and then who's getting harmed. Um, this is the harder part, but I want to see you try to do this on your final exam, is how then does the group that benefits uses legal interpretations to justify the reason why they're in control? So I'll give you one example that comes off at, at, at work a lot. Um, when a white person gets hired at Kingsborough, uh, the argument will be that no black people or no people of color or no women uh, applied to the job and that there's, there's not enough uh, that apply. And this is just factually incorrect. But you want to think about why does the group that discriminates use that kind of logic uh, to back up their point of view? And I'm wondering if anybody, can anybody see why that group does that, legally speaking? Um, I mean, that's, although you could see right through the fake answer, it's the only way that they can justify not hiring those black people and women without basically getting into legal trouble. That's exactly correct, right? So they use like an answer that 
is not racist <laughs> uh, to cover up the thing that they're doing as racist. So you can look at that example, um, or you could look at you know a number of other examples where it's always the same thing. Now, the bigger question that I'm hoping you all will start to think about is why do so many people fall for this argument? I mean, you, it gets so absurd. I mean, one time in class, a student talked about uh, black folks having an extra Achilles uh, in class, right? Because they heard that on social media. So why is it that people believe these statements, even though they're factually untrue? Um, I, is that a question? Should I attempt to yeah. answer? Yeah, go for it. Um, I think because when people hear all these things, they have two choices. They can either listen to them and not do any research and just if they hear it once, hear it twice, hear it three times, okay, it's true, which is what most people do. Or you can say, well, this is something I heard. Let's fact check it. Let's Google it. Let's see what other people say. And then after you know doing a little bit of research, they can see that a certain person having a second Achilles is the stupidest thing that okay, so let, let me give you an example that's maybe a little less stupid, right? Um, <laughs> okay. So, you know, another thing that will come up, especially in criminal justice classes, uh, is the incorrect statement that women are, are biologically weaker than men and therefore shouldn't be in NYPD, shouldn't be in the, uh, the fire department. Now, you know who tends to agree with that more? Is women. And oftentimes women who are interested in pursuing a career in NYPD or uh, FDNY. So, you know, on the one hand, um, I agree with you. With some basic research, they could change their mind. But I want you to think about the typical classroom, right? Not the Zoom classroom, but the typical classroom. Uh, what, would, what would be one motivation for a woman to pretend that she believes in the myth uh, just to get through the class? And assume for a second that she's got a male professor. Um, I guess to avoid conflict and embarrassment, maybe? Like, um, to just not contradict the obvious um, kind of disconnect that there is. Like, she won't say, um, well, obviously women are as capable as men because she doesn't want that backlash from her professor and her classmates that are clearly those men who think that men are more capable than women. Any other, Janice or Ashley? Um, I believe that she might not speak up or say anything about it because, like he said, she might receive backlash. And she also, it also could depend what her family's telling her. Like her family explains that women are weaker and men are more stronger physically and mentally, probably. What about you, Ashley? Sorry, hold on, just give me one second because I'm at work right now. I was listening. I'm just helping somebody. <laughs> you could ask them what the answer is. <laughs> Let me just I, add my mic wasn't good, but I laughed I laughed at that. I just <laughs> it was kinda of funny but... What uh you know, it's it's lonely here on Zoom. Um let me add one thing. I mean, you're both correct, right? Obviously, like your behavior is going to be based on your experiences with your family, with your friends and your workplace. It's also going to be you're going to calculate. You're going to say, I don't want to say this thing because there's going to be some social cost. Um, but I also want you. That's the negative side. I want you to think of the positive side as well, is that she might know that she's going to become NYPD. So it really doesn't matter what she says in the classroom. Right. When she becomes NYPD, then she'll have proved that stereotype wrong. So it's not necessarily a strategic decision um, to you know, exercise your agency in that, in that situation. And I, I want you to think about that, especially when you think about like Black Lives Matter, uh, in like why it became socially beneficial to protest in the streets, whereas you know, after Trayvon Martin, it was not. Like what was the difference uh, in how social media was being used, um, probably some reaction to the Trump presidency and et cetera. Like the, the social conditions will kind of create a different reaction. And that's why that's what I was hoping. Nobody did, but I was hoping that you all would see that when you compared constitutions. So the South African constitution in particular uh, was re a result of the end of apartheid. Um, 
as a legally justified system, right? So one group had lost their power over another group, and so then the Constitution reflected that. Um, the other constitutions are much more ideal, uh, and they don't, they're not, because they're not responding to a direct social conflict. So I might just jump to the last one, the Kingsborough Constitution, which, you know, a couple of students actually thought was friendly towards students, but students have like zero say in whether tuition goes up, um, whether racist professors are punished, um, hiring practices, I mean, how much to charge or, or how classes should be scheduled. Um, so what would it take for Kingsborough students to, to I initiate some kind of a revolution or to act up in that case, based on what you've said so far? Um, I think that there's no way we could reach that agreement on students won't be able to have a say unless they all get up and they do start that revolution. So they kind of have to come together. I think that they have to disagree with the um, Constitution in order to make a change, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, you've, you've hit the major issues like one, they'd have to be aware there's such thing as a King's World Constitution. I'm assuming none of you knew that existed. Right, I had no clue. The second thing would be, you know, all of the examples I gave you were when people physically came together. So you can see the problem of distance learning or Zoom-based, you know, education. Who holds all the power in this structure? Um, in the in the Kingsborough Constitution, um, probably the I don't know what's good. The teachers, like the the staff. Uh, right, the professors, right? The professors. So let's say I suck at online education, um, and that's the scientific word, right? Suck. Uh, what punishment could possibly exist would be number one question. And then two, if I'm another faculty member, would I ever want to punish another faculty member? I mean, otherwise people might start looking at how I teach online, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I get that. So, you know, the, the opportunities for you all to kind of influence the direction of the college are very, very minimal in this environment. So that's really kind of like, you could look at the ideal of the constitution, but in reality, none of those ideals are being maintained. So I want to just kind of think more about then how does the group in power, in this case professors, right, but in the United States, right, it's been white men of privilege who own property, right? So what they've done is after the fact, right, after they've kind of restored their power in the relationship, they use the law to create myths, to create stories about why it should be that way. So Scott versus Sanford, if you guys read that case, that was allegedly based on what was called natural law or science. They were saying, you know, if we just look out into the world, white people are in power, uh, black people are being enslaved, and so therefore white people should legally have the power. Uh, Plessy versus Ferguson picked the same idea. It said, well, you know, black people should be at the back of the, back of the train uh, because white people are at the front of the train. In Planned Parenthood, men said that they should make laws uh, prohibiting abortion for women because women are inferior, because they're weaker and because they need to serve their husbands. Uh, in Miller versus California, a man said he needed to protect all of the children in America, which is pretty amazing, um, from having to see uh, images uh, in an art gallery that might actually be offensive. Um, now, much more subtly, uh, Homden versus Rumsfeld established this idea that we all need to be protected uh, from terrorists before they ever get into the United States. Um, this was an interesting one because now the white man has left the United States and is now going worldwide uh, on the principle that this is the way the world should be. Uh, and then Hawaii is the last case that Trump really tried to push this even further uh, and say that the United States should actually have power other other countries' immigration systems uh, because that's the way that the world uh, should work. Um, so I'm hoping that you kind of see, I can't admit this person. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping that you can kind of see how this kind of legal argument works and how people take more and more power. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Are there any yeah. questions yeah. On, on that part? 
Hmm. Okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to use the mouse here. Oh, now I've done it. Can you all see this participants box? Ashley? Can you see the participants box? You're talking about Ashley's box? Yeah. It says like... Uh... I see it. It's right here. But there's only four people in it. It's uh, you and then three of us. Right. Screen's not letting me close it. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, on your screen go. you're playing? Yeah. No, I can okay. pull it on myself. It's not on. Oh, your you screen. got it. Okay. <laughs> so you could close it on your end. Yeah. Okay. I won't worry about it then. Okay. So the reason why, you know, I, I, this, this slide is just to help you understand that, like, there's no such thing as a landmark case. I know, like, $200 textbooks say there's such a thing, um, but that's not how the law works, right? So. I just showed you how like going back from the early 1800s all the way up to 2016, judges build on top of legal cases, right? So because the United States was built on a racist, sexist system, the law was built that way as well. And so you're not going to make any revolutionary change within that legal framework. So I'm hoping that there's a question there. No question? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's kind of depressing, right? <laughs> I mean, the hard part is that you'd have to change the Constitution in order to change the opinions based on the Constitution. Or you'd have to have a completely different kind of Supreme Court that then overruled every single one of these cases. Like, for example, Scott versus Sanford has never been overruled. I mean, isn't the Constitution basically based on opinions of the people that made it? They chose, they sat down and talked about how this rule and this rule should be put in and this rule shouldn't be put in. Right. But a large percentage of people especially white people in the United States, believe that those opinions are facts. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you. So, you know, the, the challenge when it comes to, you know, legal resistance is you're going to have to change the minds of, like, the rest of society as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you look at cases, um, and this is why you should read the cases and not you know, try to find some summary online, is that you want to look for the reasoning, right? The rule is the part that doesn't really change. Um, so for example, a lot of people say, think in Brown versus Board of Education that the rule, like if you go onto Google and you search for a brief, it'll say something like separation, um, is never equal, or they'll say something like it overturned the segregation rules, um, but that's not true. Um, in fact, I, the example I gave you earlier was kind of the tricky way of getting around that separate is never equal argument, is you simply just say it's not separate. And that was the argument that they were making in Plessy, is that, well, it's not separate because they're on the same train. Or, you know, a lot of students that I talked to say, well, Kingsboro is very diverse. Sure, except for there's a huge lack of rich white kids, right? There's like no rich, rich white kids in Kingsboro. Uh, so that's a segregated environment. And somebody would say, well, but you're getting an equal education. Well, I'm not so sure about that, right? If you go to NYU and you look at like the quality of the, of the classroom, of the text, um, you know, it, it's not the same. And so the way that people are getting around it is not the rule. Right? It's the reasoning. It's how they're explaining that opinion that they have about the Constitution. And that's really what constitutional law is all about, 
is how do people actually reason, how do they explain the rule, uh, not just simply stating that there is a rule. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, I get that. So let me give you a pretty common um, example that people always seem to get wrong. Um, does everybody more or less agree that, that murder, you know, as a command is you should not murder? You should not kill other people? Yes. Yeah, I agree with yes. you. And I'm sure you've heard from people that that's a moral reason that's based on, like, natural, right? That's It's natural not to go around killing people, right? I yes. hope so. And then you'd say something like, you know, if people are going around killing people, then there'd be chaos and, and the world would be out of control, right? Yeah. yeah. So the pro there's a few problems with that. The number one common understanding is that that was not the moral rule. The moral rule is thou shall not kill anybody outside of your tribe. Can anybody see why that's obvious in common sense? Yes. Because who are you supposed to kill? The enemy. The enemy. And so if you just like thought about it historically, mass murder is the standard operating procedure of humans. What we really don't like is when you kill somebody in your family or if you kill somebody in your neighborhood or if you kill somebody on the subway, right? Those are the things we don't like. But we'll come up with all sorts of exceptions. We'll come up with all sorts of explanations by simply saying, well, that was the enemy. Does that make sense? Yes. So let's say the guy that was going around stabbing uh, homeless people pulls up this defense. He says, well, these are my enemies. Why is the reasoning not as good as if I was actually, you know, in a battlefield somewhere, let's say Syria? Because it wasn't commanded for him to do it. That's an interesting argument, right? So if he was a part of some kind of a militia and then he went around killing, uh, you know, I, let's, let's switch over to the Trump uh, insurrection, right, in the Capitol. Somebody died in that, you know, interchange and they were commanded to do it. Is that a good excuse then? Um, it seems tempting, right? But what would, be, what would be the reason why the reason isn't as good as if you were like, say, fighting a, a war in some other country? I mean, because right now at least, we're not in the middle of any kind of conflict with anyone else we're call, we're all i mean although there are sides for everything we're not really fighting anyone no one's the enemy i i think well I, there was you, no like life or death situation yeah but you know the event that occurred right under the laws of war was an act of war and they were threatening they were armed and they do believe that liberals are their enemy. So are they justified in killing Democrats? No, just based on the fact that liberals, Democrats and Republicans, they are the what's made the country. They run the country like those two parties run the country over individuals and, you know, other parties. You're falling back into that early thinking. The missing issue here is what they said about Trump. They're saying that Trump did not command them to do it. That was the legal finding, right, from the impeachment? Yes. So if they had found legally that Trump had told them to do it, it would have been a war. But by finding legally that he did not tell them to do it, what is it? Justified? It's unjustified. See, this is the hard part. I agree with you that it's confusing. But if Trump had commanded them to do it, and there was legal, if they found that legally, then it would be war, and we'd be in a civil war. That's why I'm pushing back a little bit again, as Samuel said, right? We seem to be in a civil war, but we're not legally in a civil war. And why is that? because the United States Senate, right, the Congress decided that we're not. That's the only separation. So go back to what Janice was saying earlier, is that you know the Constitution was founded on opinions of different groups of people. That's true today as well. So the law is always based on the different opinions of different people. 
But scientifically speaking, when one group of people kills another group of people, that's called war, right? Yes, I understand. I'm starting to understand. Right. And the funny part about this is, you know, as you go on, especially if you take like cultural anthropology, if we were talking, if I was suddenly talking about a tribe on an island in the South Pacific, you all would say it was war. But for some reason, when we apply it to the United States, we go, oh, no, that's not war. Because we've been socialized to think about it. We right. need some... I think it's because, sorry, I think it's no, because we, we assume that we as people are more civilized now and we aren't, um, not, I don't want to say we aren't capable, but we wouldn't think to start something like that. So we wouldn't really see it to be necessary um, of thinking, oh, yeah, are we capable of that? Could it be? Because no one saw, I mean, no one saw this coming, whatever, I mean. Well, uh, that's not true. I taught about this right, in 2011. <laughs> um, it's just we don't usually think of each other as violent in that way anymore, I think. I mean, when you talk civil war in today's day and age, like in America, it's just crazy to think about. So no one really wants to admit it. But I guess since no one said anything directly, you can't call it that. Well, but one of the reasons why I wanted to pull this case out for you guys is that I assume you were you were all either not born yet or, or too young to remember the World Trade Center attack. And that war on terror has never ended legally. So you, your generation has forgotten that we're supposed to believe that all humans are violent and that we're at a war with each other, right? So somehow you all didn't get that in the social education. I mean, is that, is that a bad thing? I'm not a religious leader, right? Right, I guess. <laughs> I'm just saying that, you know, what it's interesting because yeah. if if those individuals had been from the country of Iran, I think people would have said, well, right, that's terrorism. But because they were from, you know, Alabama and Oregon and Wisconsin, people had a harder time because they're from our tribe, right? They had a harder time saying, well, this is war. So it's much easier to justify the exclusion of people from law when they're not from your same tribe. And tribe, of course, is very difficult to define, right? How do you define what a tribe is? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna push to the next slide to try to help you kind of sink this in. So it's easy to kind of like not think about homeless people uh, having rights because they wouldn't be a part of the tribe. And why is this? It's because of the story that we all buy into uh, through social media, celebrity, etc. Now, the fact is that this entire economic system was built by excluding Africans and then justifying that based on racial inferiority and superiority. And nothing has changed except for the system has excluded a whole lot more people. So it's not just Africans that have been excluded. Now we've excluded, you know, Mexicans, Chinese, women, the disabled. And now we've got to the point where we have so successfully excluded the homeless that it's expected that they wouldn't be able to get a job. Does everybody kind of understand this? Yes. Yeah, I understand. So I want you to think about if the victims on the, the subway train were children of people who went to work versus homeless people, what's the social reaction? I mean, although everyone is saddened by what happened and kind of disgusted and questioning and whatever, I think that, yeah, if they were to be children, there would kind of be, it would be more well known and more talked about and everyone would be a little more sympathetic um, because of just who the victims were. And then think back to law as social control, right? If everybody thought, well, the law is a command and there's a consequence if you break the rules, there is billions of dollars being spent on police. There's billions of dollars being spent on surveillance. And yet this man took on essentially, you know, you saw the size of that knife, right? Walked onto the subway and stabbed four different people in the span of, you know, 10, 12 hours. You kind of get, it's, it's not so much that he did it, it's who he did it to, right? If he would have done the same thing at Lincoln Center, 
there would have been a much swifter response. It would have shut down a lot quicker. So vulnerable people who are excluded also don't get the benefit of that idea of law as a command. In other words, you can get away with crime in certain communities, whereas you can't get away with it in other communities. And again, this is based on in America, especially in New York, what is your economic value? Does everybody kind of understand this? Yeah, yeah. I understand. Okay. So now this is the flip side of the other problem. So on the one hand, you can't just change the legal system and expect the social system to respond. In this one, you can't just change the social system and ex get the legal system to respond. And this goes back to Janice's point. The problem about the, the fact or the idea that some people believe the fact of the Constitution is that it's a property-based Constitution, meaning it gives priority to people who own property. And that was built on the belief that people who own property are better. They're more civil. They're civilized, like you said. They're more likely to follow the rules. Now, even though this is not scientifically true, right? There's no biological evidence of this. We still today believe this to be true. What evidence do I have that I could find that people still believe that those who own property are better or more civil and more you know entitled to justice than those who do not. Do you guys think of anything? Famous people like singers, actors, they all have like mansions or like Rick Ross. He has like a freaking million acre house, like just people like that with money. And yet, as you saw, right, what happened in Nicki Minaj's dad? Got hit by a car. So all that money, all that property really doesn't change much when it comes to the social system. And we could go through this, you know, I, I used to know T.I.'s lawyer and he would talk about all the things T.I. did not have, right? But T.I. would go on to TV and pretend to have all those things, right? When in reality, he was supremely in debt. Trump was supremely in debt. Zuckerberg is supremely in debt. I bet Elon Musk is also, you know, supremely in debt. But we believe so much that if I have some possession, right, if I have a house or if I have a car, then I must be some kind of safer, better, more responsible kind of human. When, of course, this is pure nonsense. So this is kind of the way you need to think about it is that the whole socioeconomic system, the property-based system, is what creates all these roles and what kind of gets people to fall for these ideas. So this is known you know, as enlightenment, if you guys have learned this yet. Um, in theory, you were supposed to learn it before taking this class, but I'll just make sure you get it here, is that, you know, it, it and you can see, right, these are all white men, uh, and it traveled from Europe to the United States, um, but here's the problem, right? You know, the statement that Thomas Jefferson gives is equal under nature's God. So it's not the nation's God, right? It's not the Trump supporter's God. Uh, it's not your God. Uh, and it's not a universal God, right? It's not the God of life and death. So what is nature's God? Anybody have a guess? Can you repeat that one more time? Yeah, if, if, if nature's God is not a country's God, it's not your God, and it's not a universal God, what is it? Um, the, uh, that's hard. I don't know. The, I don't, um, the Constitution? Close. I don't know. Very, very close. Um, I don't know. <laughs> the bad news is it's, it's your opinion. <laughs> it's reason, you know, with a capital oh, R. Wow. It's this idea somehow that because you can think, uh, because you can come up with an opinion, that's, that's what everybody can do. And so that's nature's God, right? Allegedly, that's what makes us different than animal, other animals. Can anybody see any problems with this? I mean, I, I have it on the slide, but can you see any kind of obvious problems? Um, everyone's opinions are different. Everyone thinks differently, obviously. Now, you would think that people would say, okay, everybody thinks differently. Everybody has their own opinion. And so therefore, there is no God. But that's not what people do. 
What do people normally do? I mean, just to look on social media, for example, with people's opinions. They um, share them if they agree to them. And they disrespectfully disagree. Right. Um, it, yeah. So much so that like Kanye West can go on social media and say that he is God, uh, while at the same time claiming he's an evangelical Christian, and other evangelical Christians simultaneously believe that he is God and he is not God at the same time. I mean, it gets so confusing if you base, you know, nature's God on just simply the, the idea that I can say something out loud and people can agree with me. Um, but you should see now, if I just go around enslaving people and then I say, well, here's why I enslave them, it's because they're inferior. Nobody's going to ask the you know, enslaved African, hey, by the way, buddy, are you inferior, right? They're only going to ask the person who's the master, the person who's the actual slaver. And that's very one-sided, right? That's not ever actually getting to the scientific basis, right? Because if you do your research, or as you saw hopefully on the, the mapping, we're mostly talking about children. Did everybody see that with like human trafficking and with slavery? It's mostly children. Yeah. So it's not that the you know children are not inferior, but they're smaller, <laughs> they're more trusting, right? Everybody kind of sees this problem. Yes. So language starts to be kind of a tool that law uses to justify kind of its its contradictions. Oops. So if you think about this just in the sense of of the COVID crisis and homelessness. Here is like this person I'm working with, Rob Robinson, he put this together. You know, the immediate idea was like, we have to deal with the homeless because they're gonna get everybody sick. So if you go back to this property-based legal system, why was this the approach that the city took? Who are they protecting? They were protecting people who were not homeless. Right. And so they're the enemy, right? So they just constructed this situation where homeless people are other. They're not entitled to the same rights that we're entitled to until they become dangerous to us. Now, I want to just kind of make this comparison then also to what are people mostly saying, at least I'm seeing on the news, uh, about the individual who was carried that knife uh, onto the subway and then stab those people. What are they mostly saying to explain his behavior? He has a mental illness. Now, we could say for a second, like, it's immoral what he did, correct? Yeah. But he's obviously not debilitated. He was clearly very rational. He was able to get on the subway. He picked the A line, which went from point to point and back. It's not easy to stab somebody to death. You guys kind of getting where I'm going with this? Yeah. Mental illness is not an explanation for murder. Right. So why are people deciding that that's better for them? I think that um, it's just an answer to make it like justifiable in their head and like, okay, it'll go away. Yeah, he, okay, he had a mental illness. That's it. Ne like next problem. So, I also feel like it's he they say he might have a mental illness for like viewers to feel bad for him like oh this gives him like giving him a reason basically or justifying what he did oh he's sick he's like he has to get rehab you know and so there's kind of like two pro like two or three problems that we could analyze right if I feel sorry for the person who went around killing homeless people am I ever doing anything about homelessness no and if I'm saying that the guy who killed the people has a mental illness, am I, ever, am I doing anything about the fact that the police just frankly weren't doing their job? No. So nobody is actually going to be responsible for this situation. Everybody kind of points their finger and they point to things that don't exist, like homelessness and mental illness. Those two things are not things I can go to the store and buy, right? They're not objects. They're things I explain about a situation. So once again, you see language justifying the power relations. And those who can stay home won't be putting themselves at risk in the subway. You see the kind of problem there? Yeah. So the opposite way of looking at this then is to look at it from the resistance point of view. 
So one method of resistance is to point out the people who are producing homeless people. And those, of course, are landlords. I don't, I think everybody on this is probably renters, right? We're all renters. So we're, this is not surprising to us, right? If you have a bad landlord that kicks you out on the street, it's gonna be very difficult to recover from that activity. Has anybody ever had a bad landlord? No. You're yeah, lucky. I mean, they're just annoying. But they haven't so, they haven't done anything illegal yet? No, not that I know of. So, you know, so then it's kind of like a lottery, right? It's like we have landlords that are being um, annoying and it wouldn't be too much harder for them to then be illegal. And then it turns out that it's really like a handful of landlords that own a bunch of properties that are always, always breaking the law. So the big question would be, why are people not resisting this unequal power relationship in New York City? Um, I think you're trying to make a connection to him, to the landlords that own a lot of properties. They own a lot of land, I guess. Good. And so if we start resisting, where are we going to live? Well, nowhere. Nowhere. <laughs> so you see the problem, you know, we could try to talk about the law. We could try to talk about the social system. But as long as only a handful of people own all the land and we believe in the myth that they're better than us, we're kind of screwed, right? You see, it's, it's, you have to start with like unpacking that lie, right? That the property-based system is the problem, right? That you can't have human legal rights in a property-based system because guess what has more property, or what has more rights than we do? Property. So to kind of wrap up is this isn't the first time this has happened, right? 2021 is not the first time that this situation existed. In fact, even in England, in the 16th and 17th century, this was the same struggle. So any ideas here? Why does this seem to be a recurrent kind of problem, at least from the 1400s to today? And think about it generationally, right? So there's a new generation every 30 years or so, and somehow each generation struggles with this problem. Can anybody think about any reasons why? So something you were supposed to learn in high school <laughs> um, is called manifest destiny. I'm guessing no. Oh, yeah. I'm familiar. So what happened in the 1400s? It's that C word, colonialism. What, what happened? What did these jokers do? They got onto boats, right? They landed, and then what did they do? They, they just like took over. They took people's property. How yeah. did they justify it? They used like their own institutions and their thought process to take over. They, they used their thought processes and their institutions and they made it stronger than those that they were taking land from. And so I want you to always think about this, right? Let's say that you're an American Indian, you're sitting here in New York, um, and somebody gives you a warning and they say, you know, in one year, these Spanish people, these French people, these Dutch people, and these English people are going to come and they're going to try to take all your land. What would you do? Um, you would become violent. Like you try and take, you try and stand your ground. You try and make sure that they don't take it from you. Right. You wouldn't, you'd build a wall, right? You wouldn't let them in. Yeah. But if you don't get that warning, and you see these people and you say, oh, hi, how's it going, buddy? And then they decide to kill you. You're at a dis you're at a disadvantage, right? Yeah. So it's kind of like watching a football game or a soccer match, but there's no referee. And so the 
team or the group that has the power from the beginning, they're going to keep holding that power because there's no way to interrupt it. Right. So it's a numbers game at this point, right? So one idea would be, you know, in a multicultural society, if the numbers change, then the power structure would change. But that's only if people don't believe in the myths of manifest destiny. In other words, you know, they don't become white. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So that's the big challenge in law is that law kind of asks you to give up things that you believe to be true and sacred and, and exchange them for this kind of, you know, opinion based system, all to protect the kind of property relations. So the only kind of tool that's been used successfully in a, the last hundred years or so, uh, starting with Lincoln's emancipation, was this idea of an abuse of power. So I want you to think about that language, right? Why is that powerful language to say, well, you've abused this power? Especially, because, go ahead. Because when you think of power, you think of people who are in charge and who are strong mentally and who can make choices for everyone. So when you abuse your power, people look down on you or they look like my leader made a wrong decision or they did something harmful to the people that they are supposed to protect. And then what does that do to your power, Janice? It makes my power even lower than what it already, what it already is. Let's try that again. When you start questioning the authority and power of people who are abusing their power, isn't that a power itself? Yes. So wouldn't you feel, I mean, in other words, in order to be able to say that somebody's abusing their power, wouldn't you have to have a pretty good idea of what power is? Yes. And so if you had that idea, why wouldn't you be powerful? Maybe because I am following or I'm, no, maybe because the, the people are following someone. I don't know. I'm right there. Um. Just think about churning around basically, right? So you would now be in charge of the people who were following. Okay, I understand. Okay. And that's the challenge, right? Is that when people are trying to follow a powerful person, they forget that there's people behind them. Okay, I understand. And one of the reasons why, you know, this class is interesting is that you're engaging with the concept of power and the abuse of power is one of those concepts that shifts the power dynamic. And, you know, if you take sociology, uh, you'll learn that this also happens with your parents. Sometimes it happens in relationships like marriages. Right. Um, but this is always kind of that give and take that I was talking about. Right. There's the legal resistance. You have the right to resist. Uh, and then the state or the social group has the right to control. But they're always kind of in pull with each other. So the, law, so the law is really just this thing that's kind of in between, right? It's not even really a thing, right? It's a, it's a language. It's a way of explaining things uh, between these two groups. Okay, and if you want more of this, right, to, to practice it, um, the presentation I have, uh, which talks about the three eyes of law, right? So you start to see law in three different dimensions or three different ways, right? It's not just the institution. That's one of the most important parts, um, but it's also this ability we just talked about, which is the instrument of law. You know, do you file a lawsuit? Do you organize a protest? Um, do you read the Constitution, explain it to other people? Um, but then it's also the ideologies of law. You know, do you believe in human rights-based law, or do you believe that property or corporations should have more power and, and rights than, than human beings? 
everybody kind of 